Good morning. My name is Deborah Coons. I'm a visual artist. Um, I'm British. I was um, emigrated to the United States in 1996 and I live and work in Reedsboro in Vermont, in southern Vermont. So I'm going to speak to you first of all about my working process as an artist. So where do ideas come from? In my case, they come from careful observation of the real world, very, very, very careful observation of the real world. They come from dreams, and if I do a meditation, I might make, wake up and have thoughts that are just rolling. I'm going to read you one rather than try and explain. So, for example, one morning I might wake up, and I'll sit here, and I'll write, and I'll write, and I'll write pages of stuff, and then eventually it feeds into the work. So this is just a, a random reading from early when I arrived at Gentel, for example. A single point becomes a line. So this line has a minimal width, and has a proclivity to kind of tilt, either left or right, along its axis. And I realize it's tracing the location of a hinge. And when certain things happen, this hinge it oscillates like this, like a hummingbird, flapping its wings so fast that you can't see it. Uh, it makes some sort of sound because it's humming. So visually it's just a blur and it's pure potential at this point in time. When I dream or imagine things, and I'm really interested in all these different experiences that we do. Are you hallucinating? Are you dreaming? Are you receiving uh, knowledge? How, what is it? But whatever creativity is, I do it in pictures. I see in pictures, I think in pictures, have a hard job with language. So the work that I'm doing is, I'm learning about the world, but I'm learning about the world by drawing. So I dream without words and then I write about what I've seen. So the resources that I use um, to to the resources that I sort of gather together in myself that result in the artwork are careful observation of the natural world, my dreams, and the kind of feedback loop between me and the making process. So what am I learning by making? And how does my own experience of being alive and in the world, making and doing, give me information? I'm a maker, deep, deep in my bones. I, have made stained glass windows for decades and that's been my life's work. And now I'm, I'm using whatever materials work and whatever materials that I need to tell the story and do the research and find out what I'm trying to find out. So I want to say something about being a maker. So most of the work that I am doing could be done on a computer and people do explore these same topics by computer. But when you build something by hand, you learn something different, okay? So let me give you an example. Um, here are three little diamonds, and here are three little diamonds. If you join them together like that, it makes a nice little bowl. And you can pop that bowl inside out without damaging it. It's pretty flexible, pretty beautiful. Fluid would flow around it or run down off the top. But if you form these same shapes, these are identical shapes, if you form these in this fashion, you can't turn it inside out. It doesn't work. This um, shape, by the way, I call this a harlequin ear, because when you're assembling them, if you're making a huge sculpture, um, it looks like the shape of the pattern on a harlequin pants. So language brings me on to another point. I've had to develop a language to describe what I'm doing because it doesn't exist and new ways to describe um, shapes that mean something to me so that I can remember how to assemble things. This is paper that I've been using to assemble a tiling pattern. What I'm doing is I'm trying to understand this pattern. It's a pattern that's made of two different shapes and it covers a surface. The geometry is a little bit, it's, it's a, it's a, it, the geometry is very, um, uh, non-traditional. So it, it, 
you think it would be easy to um, replicate this pattern, but it seems to have inner laws that are not properly understood yet by science. Uh, it also forms the structure of quasi-crystals, which are a kind of matter that is, um, it's not where the molecules are all wandering around it, all over the place, that's an amorphous solid, and the structure where the molecules are neatly ordered in a lattice, that is called a crystal, and this is called a quasi-crystal. It's, it's crystalline, but we don't understand all the rules. So it's made in laboratories, it's found in meteorites, and um, at the Trinity site, when the atomic bomb was tested, humans inadvertently created quasi-crystals. So they exist in the natural world. We also synthesize them in laboratories. So many, many material scientists, scientists understand them. So my, all of my work is based on trying to understand this not properly understood geometry. Uh, and the most significant work I did at Gentel five years ago was in sort of uh, decomposing this into separate units and seeing it as a, a collection of circles. So these, these circles. So instead of looking at it, so instead of looking at the pattern as individual little rhombuses, little diamond shapes, I started to visualize it as collections of diamonds. So the only grid I was able to work with five years ago was imperfect because it was created by the only methods that we have in math at the moment. It's called an inflation, deflation, substitution tiling. So I worked with that, but I did do some remarkable work and discovered um, a new fractal, a shape which I can use to assemble and build this pattern. My, and I'm gonna show you this shape, may I? So these shapes, I've had them cut in plywood. This is, this is helpful because this little drawing shows you how you could build one of those circular shapes that I was showing you out of lots of little pieces of wood, lots of little diamonds. So all these little diamonds. So here, look, I can take it apart. There are only two shapes and they loosely correspond to the two diamond shapes. As a, the fat diamond and the skinny diamond, we call them. And, and I've been using various methods of colour coding them to try and understand um, how they work. So I create these sheets um, by working with transparent inks and dyes over the surface of the grid. So if I lay a paper over the grid, I can then paint in a hundred different ways to help me learn something about the pattern. So all these drawings have been generated in this fashion by laying them over a surface and painting over the top. They're transparent acrylic dyes, and what they allow me to do is layer things and see what I've worked on and create new drawings on top of the existing ones. Um, they also bring in, so colour itself is a dimension, it's an, it's an extra dimension. So we think of dimension as being the one, two, three um, dimensions in real space, but as a physicist friend explained to me, anything can be a dimension. So temperature can be a dimension, hot and cold. It's another dimension. Um, this crystal, when it forms in nature, it forms in huge sheets. The sheets will theoretically go on to infinity. If you, if you understood the geometry, you could build a sheet that would go on to infinity. Um, and the question of dimensions comes in here, and I, it's worth mentioning. The, in this pattern on the table, a two-dimensional version of the quasi-crystal, it's called a P3 tiling, there are two different shapes, a fat diamond and a skinny diamond. Um, when I build this in three dimensions, 
and I need to bring one. When I build this in three dimensions, it only needs one shape, one shape. And if you imagine it tilted and the light shining through it to create this image, it depends which way it's tilted as to whether it appears skinny or fat. So I thought that was mysterious and interesting, but I have to tell you the most extraordinary thing is when a mathematician explained to me that this pattern, it can also be understood as a perfectly logical and reasonable object in mathematics in five dimensions. So if you were to imagine, um, you can't, you can't imagine a five dimensional grid. This is the point. So if I was setting my mind to this, how could I describe it? But you, this is one way to think about it. If you have a point and you move along and you make a little line, then you drag the line down and you make a square, then you drag the square along and you make a cube. Just imagine that you drag the cube two directions at once and that gives you five dimensions of space. Um, so this pattern is, mathematically speaking, a vast oblique sheet that runs through a five-dimensional grid of cubes, a five-dimensional five -dimensional matrix. So the colour can bring more dimensions into the work. And so I use colour to draw attention to things, to help people see what I'm seeing when I look at the pattern, um, and as, an, uh, as another tool. I'm working from a very, very um, strictly, um, a very strict, accurate, precise mathematical drawing. However, my paintings are imaginary. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing things that don't actually exist. Um, and this is this is this is a drawing that was the most. Um, There's a photocopy of the most important drawing I did while I was here five years ago. And through working on that, I was able to build the pattern as a three-dimensional surface. I was able to discover that it has positive and negative surface, that it flips in and out, it billows and sucks like waves. Um, and I was able to make these little pavers, the little tiny plywood pavers. However, this was the best I could come up with using the material that the mathematicians have given me. This is so exciting to me because it's basically the same drawing. The scale is different, that's a photocopy, but this is the same drawing, and this is the perimeter of the drums, right? So here's, uh, say, here's the edge of a red drum. Here's the edge of a green drum, right? And in this, this, to me, the colours still have a certain amount of randomness to it. In this painting, I'm seeing beautiful rhythm to the, look at this big V shape of the red and the black. Look at this horizontal. I'm seeing an absolutely beautiful rhythm to the pattern that I've never seen in any of the tiling, the, um, the grid, that's been given to me by a mathematician. And this I created from these, from these. So I built a new grid. So I, I took the existing grid that had been given to me by Dwayne Bailey, my computer scientist friend and collaborator on some of this work, and I, I, I corrected it according to my rules, what I discovered. And basically, look, it's all chopped apart and stuck together again. I chopped it apart and stuck it together again. And I built myself a completely new sheet. There are mathematical reasons why certain aspects would be the aspects that would change. But anyway, changed it, corrected it, and then able to build that. And when you look at it from afar, if you stay here, you can see this. Look at this cross here. That is such a clear shape that's emerging. And this, this for example, where you only see two Two different coloured drums. Each, each colour shows a drum that's facing in a different direction, basically. So when you look at this, with all these drums facing in a certain direction, that I'm now imagining as a wave. So that's what this drawing is. So I'm going <laughs> to. Here's a little drum. Here's a little drum shape. So this is just part of this the way it would fix, the way it would fit on the paper, right? 
So what I'm doing is I'm imagining these balls, which are totally imaginary things. They don't exist in the real world, but I'm using them to help me um, see what really does exist in the real world when you build this pattern in three dimensions. And I'm imagining these as waves. So the pink waves are coming in this direction, the orange waves are going in that direction, and it's like waves are rushing um, <clears throat> in a pool. They reinforce one another, they create interference patterns. Um, and, I, and so this is just waves. <laughs> the pattern has five-fold geometry, so there are waves coming out in five different directions. So this drawing just shows waves going in one direction. And my next project will be to sort of um, build and find a way of drawing them in five directions at once. So this... So each little... So this is a standing wave, like a wave front here. And this is a wave front coming in the opposite direction. So the, the waves are kind of uh, crossing over and creating interference there. This funny little thing is part of a bigger piece of sculpture, and this shape is the decagon, and this is the decagon. So this is the drawing I've been working on uh, here to help me try and understand this, right? And take this data and punch it into this drawing. So I'm trying to understand what happens to each little tiny diamond shape, each rhombus, and how that forms this drum shape. And of course, I'm drawing it like a drum. It's not at all like a drum. This is it. It doesn't look like that. It looks like that. It only looks like that in my imagination, right? And now, every single drum is going to give rise to a wave. So this is a wave front. It's a steep edge that creates this shape that's pushing uh, energy forward. I'm imagining the whole geometry as kind of an oscillation of particles that create waves. The reason I think people have difficulty understanding this pattern is because they're asking the wrong questions and because it's very... If you look at one small part, people want to understand the whole thing. And I don't believe you can understand the whole thing unless you look at it holistically and you look at the relationship between the parts. And you assume that there's a give and a take, a breathing in and a breathing out, a billowing and a sucking and a movement. So it's like so many other disciplines in the world today where we cannot be separate and individualistic. We need to be a community and we need to connect with others, like, you know, with life. So in, in this drawing, I literally took a line through one of my um, little pavers, my fractal, and I plotted the points, and I tried to imagine what it would look like as a curve. It didn't prove to be the most useful exercise, but I wanted to know. I wanted to know what would it look like if I could go do 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 my wave discovery. I'm going to call that my next Gentile discovery. Is the real beginning to handle and get a grasp of how something could be a vibrating surface and not just why do we think everything is static? And why do we think that as a human, it's like quantum mechanics? Oh, because I look, that's the begin, that's the center of the universe because I'm a human and I'm observing. Well, it's not. This pattern will go on to infinity and have many, many similar points, but they all connect to one another. So in this drawing, this is really key. There are lots of little five-pointed stars all the way across a P3 tiling, but I have discovered and delight in the fact that they're not all the same. These ones I call star voids. So see how this is made from my two shapes, my shapes, not just a diamond, my shapes with the wiggly edges. These ones I call star voids because they're sort of leftovers. But there is also a star here, look, where they come together. And this is a dark star and this is a star void. And here's another dark star. So these exist. Um, the, so this painting will be a dark, dark painting 
with dark stars and the star voids and as much other information as I can get on there. So the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge amount of data expressed in a great big picture. Um, these crossing points, and I figured these out this week actually, what's going on with these crossing points is it's places where energy is going to go thump very quickly because of the form of it. So if there's a standing wave, this is a place where, the, if you imagine energy or water or fluid, it's going to flow quickly at these points. And at the moment, I actually can't tell you, they're probably all flowing out in the same direction. I don't know. But I do know that this is a place where energy flows fast. So this is this, uh, you know, the latest breaking news on this drawing is figuring that out. <laughs> Still got plenty more work to do on this. This is underpainting, I think a painter would call it. A, you know, an oil painter would call it. If you were to take one little tiny little green rhombus and then you were to join it up with many, many others, it would create the same shape again. So that's the definition of a fractal. A fractal is something that exists with the same shape at different scales. It's easier to imagine molecules and particles when you can see these tiny ones than when you're just looking at something like this. This is like, the you, know, you can't see a particle that small. You can only imagine it. So what I'm doing is imagining. These are imaginary, um, but they're based in as much mathematics as we know at the moment. I think talking about visual art is probably a challenge for many um, artists. Uh, one of the wonderful things I've been just just begun to do is, is to write academic. Um, I've written an academic paper, which the math community reviewed, peer reviewed for me, and there were nine reviewers. Uh, what reminds me of that right now is that one of them pointed, told me just from a photograph that this corner was incorrect. So, you know, like, whoa, all of that drawing. And I have since corrected it, so now it's correct. I can tell you for sure. But um, for the handful of people on the planet who are familiar with this tiling, this P3 tiling, um, they know the mysteries and they know, the, they know what this great big shape is. It doesn't just look random or pretty. It's like specific geometric forms that are coming. So the fact that this, I, I like to assume it's a woman reviewer, but I don't know who my reviewer was because you don't get to meet your peer reviewers but she was able to tell me that it was wrong in one corner i thought that was fantastic i loved the, crit the critique the criticism it was marvelous so this is why it's so valuable to me to, to work really diligently at trying to explain my work i'm going to keep trying <laughs>